is a sort of a general uh, approach. Uh, does Russian policy uh, these days um, look, does it look at the Eastern Mediterranean as a separate uh, system from the Middle East or as, as, a, as, as one system? Because the Europeans talk about MENA, for example, mm -hmm. Middle East and uh, uh, North Africa which I think is a, is a very unhappy kind of uh, uh, association because it doesn't tell you that much uh, and it leaves out the Eastern Med. Uh, so, you know, when, when you're thinking about the region, do you think about it differently? Does it have, does Eastern Med have a different dynamic or is it part of the Middle East? Well, uh, you know, the perception that Eastern Mediterranean is a separate region or sub-region is rather new. But, uh, and I th we, we see that it was, uh, I would say, created by uh, the growing activity of Turkey and uh, the interconnectivity between uh, uh, the MENA, well, not even MENA, between the Middle East and uh, southern europe so uh, you know we, we still don't have uh, very many specialists in russia who deal with uh, eastern mediterranean well, uh, uh, recently i was making a review of russian authors who write about eastern mediterranean and i could find only about three persons who do it regularly so this is rather new and uh, well um, by tradition, usually this uh, region is uh, followed by specialists who deal with with the Middle East. But uh, it, but it's complicated, you know. When we had to, when we were arranging a seminar, uh, we we had this year a big seminar on the Eastern Mediterranean, and uh, we invited uh, uh, specialists who. Uh, cover not only, for example, Turkey or Libya or Syria, but we also invited specialists on Greece, on Cyprus, because, well, it, it's, um, in our understanding, it's, you know, it's kind of, um, how to say, it? it's on the border between two regions and well, it's, it's still complicated. We, we haven't made our minds yet, whether it's more about Europe or whether it's but more you, about Middle you know, East. This is it, and it leads into my, the first question I sent you, was in, uh, because you were very uh, good in, uh, and uh, uh, we thank you for sort of tying into the Soviet period mm -hmm. and that uh, the difference, uh, the evolution of Russian policy from then. But there was a previous historical experience for Russia. And I think there, the, the code word for our region was the Near East. And the Near mm -hmm. East covered the Balkans, it covered Greece, it covered uh, the sick man of Europe uh, being Turkey, it mm -hmm. covered uh, the Eastern Med, etc. And then the Middle East, the Middle and actually, uh, the, 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 the coast of, um, of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean was part of the Near East. The Middle East was the Gulf, uh, was, uh, you know, Iraq and, and mm -hmm. so on. So, and then Correct. it all got captured into the Middle East and the Middle East came up to Greece, you know, and it's not, you know, the, uh, is it perhaps useful to look on, on the relations of Russia uh, before the previous historical periods, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Tsarist periods, uh, and how they saw the, the Near East. And perhaps, and because uh, you also mentioned uh, the, the relationship with Turkey being fren uh, frenemy, Mm -hmm. And I think this is what characterized the the, the Tsarist periods, the, the pre-Soviet periods. There was a tension, but also an acceptance of the relationship with Turkey. And, and the role of Russia was accepted in the Eastern Med. Mm -hmm. uh, I think during Soviet times, it was perhaps less accepted by the West, 
But in pre-Soviet times, uh, the presence of a Russian fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean was, was seen as normal. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Fighting against the pirates, uh, fighting for this or that. I mean, it, it was a different world, yes. But are we going back to that kind of mentality today? Well, first of all, I have to say I admire your knowledge of uh, Russian uh, vision of the region because we st in Russian we still say Near East when we talk about Israel, Palestine, uh, Syria or Lebanon, it's Near East in Russian. And uh, the Gulf, uh, the, the Persian Gulf and uh, Iran, it's the Middle East actually, well, when, you use, when we use Russian uh, names. But anyhow, well, uh, I, I understand that you are trying to find continuity between uh, the policies of the Russian Empire and the policies of the Soviet Union. Well, uh, I have to say that... No, no, the, the, and, and the current... Yes, uh, and Russia. of course, and uh, the, the modern Russia, indeed. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I don't think that uh, Russia has uh, really in, any imperial aspirations towards Eastern Mediterranean. You know, and besides, as far as I know from uh, uh, the history I was uh, taught at the university, well, for the Russian Empire, the Eastern Mediterranean was important, uh, first of all, due to its religious significance. Yeah. Well, because there were always strong ties with the local uh, Christian communities. But also, it was always about the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire and those strained relations between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And you probably remember that the issue of uh, the Black Sea Straits was on the agenda even during the First World War. So uh, <clears throat> clearly, for the Russian Empire, dealing with this issue was always very important. And of course, since, we, uh, since the Russian Empire had strong connections with the Balkan states, uh, very complicated relations with Turkey, the presence of the uh, Russian Imperial Navy in the Mediterranean was essential. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, and, uh, but speaking uh, about uh, the current situation, I still see more continuity with the Soviet policies yeah. than, uh, than uh, the, any continuity with the, with the imperial policies. The, the, only, the only thing, I, I'm, I'm not uh, probing uh, for uh, any continuity in the imperial uh, 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 wishes or desires of, uh, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I, because Russia was clearly part of the concert of Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm looking for is, because from what I heard, the, 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 the subtext of, of what you were saying is that Russia wishes again to be part of the game. Definitely. And Russia an accepted won't... member of the game. An accepted oh. member again of, of the concert of, of the region and the concert of Europe. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's the acceptance from the West uh, that, that I... Do you see it and how, you know, obviously you mentioned it. This is what I think Russian policy is all about now. It's becoming part of the system. Exactly. I, I strongly agree because, well, actually, the, the idea that the, the Russian strategy was always, I mean, uh, the strategy of the, car, of the modern Russia, it was always to develop strong ties with the Europeans. Uh, Russia was always aspiring to become uh, a member of the European family, despite there are uh, disagreements on such things as... Uh, well, democracy, rule of law, or human rights, well, there are controversies. But geopolitically, Russia was always interested in uh, strong and, uh, I would say, positive, positive interaction with the European states. And uh, uh, from that point of view, uh, Russia was trying to develop, uh, to find partners. Well, as for, as for Southern Europe, it's clear that Russia has still historically uh, very uh, strong interests, uh, very uh, uh, strong interests in uh, the Balkans, 
uh, there is willingness to develop ties with such countries as Greece or, for example, Italy. But uh, um, since Russia is growing more active uh, on, uh, uh, in its uh, foreign policy, then, uh, of course, uh, we, we always have those issues that, were, um, that are based on, uh, the, ge on the geography. On the ge on geography. Russia cannot avoid dealing. Uh, yes, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> Same problem for me. <laughs> so Russia cannot avoid uh, dealing with uh, with the Turkey uh, with the Turks. Uh, Russia cannot avoid um, uh, dealing with uh, the European uh, w with the European Union, and Russia has to pay attention to what is happening uh, on its southern borders. So uh, this is, this is uh, from many, uh, for many of us, is simply dictated by geography. Uh, but also we have now uh, geopolitical, uh, geopolitical circumstances that also uh, force Russia to increase its activity in this region. And there are also, you know, uh, we cannot discount economic interests like uh, energy flows. Uh, Which you have said, even the arms mm -hmm. uh, trade is important. Uh, yeah, here, uh, would you like to take over some of the questions? Well, no, um, you know, um, we obviously um, are thinking how, um, how do you... Um, create stability um, in, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and, um, and Russia is um, probably one of the most important players, not the only one. And, um, and there's a lot of potential friction and there's a lot of potentially joint interests. Um, and um, we want to find a way how to do this best. Um, uh, so, um, the basic question is, um, um, assuming that, um, uh, from an Israeli point of view, there, um, there are two assumptions that, um, that are important. The one is that the United States um, has, from an Israeli point of view, I don't know, from the American point of view, but from an Israeli point of view, to remain um, um, Israel's ally. Mm -hmm. And then the United States is moving out of the um, area anyhow. Um, how can we, um, in the Mediterranean, on the navies, come to some... How can, can Russia come to terms with the United States in this area? And can we be of some help? Or um, can, how, how do we build um, a structure where there's a win-win instead of win-lose situation? Mm -hmm. I can see your point. Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, for Russia, Israel is viewed uh, as an important ally. Well, by itself, we mean I mean that Russia, uh, Israel is important from many points of view. But also, Israel is important as a country which is influential in the United States, or at least uh, our leadership believes that Israeli. Uh, um, leaders have access to the Congress that they can always talk to the people in, in the White House. You know, um, earlier, especially when uh, the tensions were growing in, for example, 2014 to 2015, uh, I, I used to say that uh, for, for the Kremlin, Israel is always viewed as a backdoor to the United States or an emergency communications channel. You know, I remember I was very close to Simon Perez um, in in the in the nineteen eighties, and um, by nineteen eighty five onwards, um, it was um, Nimrod Novik um, who um, was sent to to Russia, and um, we had a very important role. In improving relations between Shevardnadze and Gorbachev and and the um, the Reagan administration, um, so we we have that very positive mm -hmm. memory. 
Um, uh, we we obviously would like to do something like this today, um, but I don't know how where to start and and how to do things. But as far as I understand, you were already trying to do this when you arranged meetings between Russian officials and American officials, and when you helped them discuss uh, the Syrian the situation in Syria, for example. Because, well, I think Syria is the most problematic case at the moment for U.S.-Russia relations. I mean, in the context of the Middle East. Uh, still, uh, we, we often see that there are frictions between Russian military and the U.S. military. And uh, there, are, there is very strong uh, mutual mistrust, you know. When, when, we, when I talk to the Russian military, I often hear that the Americans are trying to build a Kurdish entity in Syria and that the Americans are trying to undermine uh, the territorial integrity of Syria. They, they do believe this. Uh, the, the, the Americans are seen uh, as a hostile force, as a spoiler. That's the problem. Actually, when you were talking about, you, uh, th there was a question in that list about U.S.-Russia interaction in the Middle East. Well, from my point of view, it is very important to convince the Americans that uh, Russia is not trying to play a destabilizing role. On the contrary, Russia is also interested in stabilizing the region. But uh, the Americans always view Russian efforts as, a, as an attempt to uh, increase Russian presence to uh, to do something uh, hostile towards uh, the US but it it, it is no, it is a very dangerous cold war logic uh, though <clears throat> the, the problem is that there are also people with uh, cold war logic here in Moscow so <laughs> when they meet each other we, we, we clearly have growing tensions but actually for for at least two or three years starting from 2016, uh, the Middle East was viewed as, an, as a region where Russia and the U.S. could actually cooperate. The, initially, initially, there was hope for uh, positive, fruitful cooperation in, uh, in, uh, on the issue of the Syrian uh, settlement, on the issue of stabilizing Libya, so, and uh, even probably, probably containing Turkey to a certain degree, because Russia was very much concerned about uh, the Turkish behavior, especially in Syria, but uh, very quickly it was understood that uh, the Syrian issue must be discussed with the Turks directly. Because, well, <laughs> the problem with the Americans, well, at least now, is uh, we can see that they don't have much influence, uh, for example, on the Syrian opposition. They are not players in this domain. When we, we, when we would try to find contacts or cooperation with the Syrian opposition, then we should go to Ankara, not to Washington. But they still have a um, very strong influence uh, on the Kurdish issue. And they, this is a problem. This is a problem and uh, the Kurdish issue uh, is bothering us. We also uh, often, what, what concerns uh, the Russian side? We often hear Americans or American officials and officials and experts and NATO officials talking about some red lines that will uh, provoke uh, uh, more uh, active response from the US in case Ru Russia crosses those red lines. For example, uh, once I, oh, no, twice I was told that uh, for the Americans, uh, one of these red lines is. Uh, establishment of Russian military bases in Libya, for example. So, you know, they, they still view Russia as a country which is trying to um, create some kind of a sphere of influence in this region, that Russia is uh, trying to uh, establish uh, much uh, more massive military presence in this region. Well, you know, I, I don't like this logic at all. Though, those, I've been dealing with the issue, for example, with Syria, you know, I was working uh, on the 
you know, uh, participating in U.S.-Russia contacts on Syria for several years. And I couldn't find a way <clears throat> to solve the problem because, you know, we have two different mentalities <laughs> that do not simply uh, match each other, you know. Uh, uh, the Americans are, uh, you know, both, uh, both sides, uh, they simply don't listen uh, to, to each other. That, that's, that's one of the problems. And they, they, that is why they can't uh, establish some kind, uh, some kind of constructive relation in this region instead of uh, playing spoilers or uh, complicating uh, the situation. That's what I see. But actually, what I can say, what I can say, still, despite all the, all the problems, all the tensions that exist, Russia is still uh, hoping I would say hoping to find some ways to cooperate with the Americans because at the moment the agenda is mostly negative and you know even now we hear very disturbing things for example I, I was following uh, the the trip of uh, the American um, uh, defense minister to uh, to the Black Sea countries and he openly stated that uh, the U.S. will do its best to strengthen uh, countries like Romania, Bulgaria, to make them uh, more capable uh, of, uh, you know, countering uh, Ukraine, to make them more capable of countering Russian uh, hostile actions. You know, that sounds really disturbing, at least for us. Sure. And for people in the Kremlin who have still, you know, their, their mentality was uh, formed uh, several decades ago, when the Cold War was still a reality. And for them, such statements uh, are, see, for them, they, these are uh, clear statements of aggressive intentions. You know, we can see that uh, tension is uh, growing in the, in the Black Sea very quickly. Uh, and that, if, if the Black Sea is destined, it becomes a region of uh, confrontation, then the, uh, the Mediterranean will also become a, a region of confrontation, inevitably. Because as I said, you know, the Eastern, East Med uh, is viewed as part of, a, of an outer defense perimeter. But as for the Mediterranean, I would say that Russia is willing to uh, cooperate with the Americans. But uh, there is always this problem of, you know, equal partnership. Equal partnership instead of, uh, you know, uh, you know, there is a sense that the Americans are bullying Russia in, in many regions, including uh, the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. So there, there is problem. Uh, the, I, I would say that we need to improve, uh, first of all, some uh, the, the the climate, the atmosphere in U.S.-Russia bilateral relations, and only after that we'll be able to do something, uh, well, specific. But still, there are people in Moscow who believe that we can go the other way. So we find small things, like you know, low-hanging fruit to cooperate in certain regions where where confrontation isn't strong enough. We cannot cooperate on Ukraine, though I wish we could. Because the Ukraine, because the Ukraine is is an issue, but uh, still looking for some small uh, ways to find uh, to, to make it positive. You know, for example, we were trying to discuss um, potential ways to reduce uh, the consequences of U.S. sanctions for Syria, or to establish channels for humanitarian assistance. The, or to improve uh, cooperation on counter-terrorism. So there were efforts. Uh, unfortunately, those efforts, they do not work very um, well. Though, though I, I can't say that there, there, is, no, uh, there is no willingness. And uh, there is also the issue of Iran that you mentioned. <coughs> the, you've met, in, in your, wait a minute. There's, there's the issue of? Iran. Iraq, Iran. Iran, Iran. Iran. Yes, uh, because well, uh, you 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 asked uh, particularly about Hezbollah, Iran, 
and such uh, things. Well, I would say that, and that's what I often say when I uh, talk to my Israeli colleagues. Well, uh, Iran, uh, Russia is not directly countering Iran in Syria, but Russian, uh, growing Russian presence will be, of course, a very, uh, well, growing Russian presence is not a threat for Israel. It is not a threat for American interests. Yes. But it will counter, uh, automatically counter the Iranian interests. Yes. You know, the Syrians, when I talk to the Syrians, including the Syrians on the top, they always say that uh, Russian presence is, they prefer Russian presence, not, not the Iranian one. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the Iranians are still uh, viewed by the Syrian public and the, the Syrian leadership as, uh, as a country which uh, will try to uh, change Syria. And uh, they believe that the Iranians will uh, try to turn Syria into their uh, junior partner and uh, they will manipulate Syria to achieve their goals. They don't want it. So, they, but uh, but somehow we can we can see that actually, uh, the well, for example, the Americans are countering Russian efforts, you know, in many ways. They are undermining, for example, the economic reconstruction of Syria now. All the Russian efforts were undermined because Russian companies are now afraid to go into Syria, uh, to rebuild the infrastructure to. Um, start the reconstruction of uh, their energy sector. So it is a problem. But, well, uh, what I would like to say that uh, strengthening Russian role, at least in Syria, will uh, definitely serve uh, the purpose of uh, guaranteeing the security of Israel. And as for Hezbollah, Hezbollah is a different story, I think. What Russia is trying to do is to engage Hezbollah into some kind of uh, positive dialogue to make, uh, to make them part of a negotiating process, you know, and that will, and that might help, not, not very quickly, but that might help to reduce tension. But uh, speaking about Iran, well, honestly, <laughs> Uh, we often hear that Iran is a vital threat, threat for Israel. We all, but, and you know, uh, many Israeli politicians, they behave in a way that the war is imminent. Yeah. But uh, we, we don't see that from Moscow. We can see that Iran has regional ambitions, no doubt of that. We can see that Iran is willing to um, increase its military potential, no doubt of that. But uh, I'm sorry to say, but in Moscow, nobody believes that Iran will ever attack Israel directly or try to destroy Israel. It's bad enough if they, um, it's bad enough if they do everything to undermine um, any peace process, which you've done all the time, and they provoke one war after the other, and they give all the, the arms and the rockets and the missiles the, um, the Hezbollah has 150,000 missiles which can hit, can, can hit every little place in Israel, and they've done so. Uh, one of them has hit um, a place 500 meters away from the flat of my son and my two mm. granddaughters. No, it's a very personal issue. It's not mm -hmm. something direct. Um, so, <laughs> but we are not very... Um, um, this is a concern... Well, we sure they will not. not. According to, my, you know, my PhD is on Iran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I understand that the Iranian abuse us in order to play a Middle Eastern game. Um, the worst thing that could happen to Iran is would be the end of Israel. They couldn't <laughs> play the game anymore. Do they I have agree. Any, well, they, yes, they I have, agree with you. <laughs> they, they have an interest in, in Israel's existence. But to make to make life miserable in such a way that we cannot tolerate. So, uh, so but um, you know, but let me ask the other way. Well, um, by, by the way, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but from my point of view, actually, the Iranians are doing a great favor to Israel because due to the Iranian threat, because of the Iranian threat, 
many Arab states want to cooperate with Israel and uh, to build alliances with Israel. Actually, the Iranians are doing Israel a huge favor because what we see, uh, you know, due, thanks to the Iranian threat, there is, a, there is a huge progress in terms of developing relations with countries like Saudi Arabia, like uh, the Gulf states, you know. Actually, what we see is that Israel is now really part of the regional, uh, um, regional community. <coughs> this is very interesting. We, no, can... we, we agree. Okay. Let, let me say where, we think, um, where I think we could start. Um, there has been this, um, this initiative of um, King Abdullah II from Jordan mm -hmm. um, to develop soft um, for energy supply um, via Syria to, um, to Lebanon. I understand it got so, uh, support, Russia's, uh, support from, from Mr. Putin and from Moscow. Um, we, um, you know, there will be the Glasgow conference in, again, in several days in, on, and, and we are working with the, the Jordanians on, on a lot of energy development, turning Jordan into a, the, the center for, for renewable energy and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, we could think of a coordinated soft power, um, soft power initiative, um, in, on all these issues and see, how this could serve, should, could serve the region at large. Um, you know, if you've got, if you've got cheap um, renewable energy, um, we understand that the United Arab Emirates has, um, has um, technologies in, on, on, on solar energy which reduce the cost of um, electricity production almost by 40%. I can give you the numbers in mm -hmm. Israeli numbers. And if this is done, you can have uh, can take care of water, and we have uh, the best uh, best technique in in water desalination. And there are many things that one could think of how do you create a soft power initiative that does um, does um, block Iran in many ways, and creates is a trust building matter. And here to work together with to find a way to work together with you with Russia. I think we could help the, the Americans get the Americans on board and say, you know, this is something, there's no way you can say no to it. And then mm -hmm. go from one place to the other. Then you slowly build trust and you build, you've said many things, which we, they all are very important. And to go one thing after the other, how you build something where there's a better understanding. Mm -hmm. That's a question. Oh, yes. Well, first of all, you know, what, what I think uh, in terms of strategy, you know, uh, the best way to solve uh, the problem of Iranian presence in Syria is to strengthen uh, the, uh, <laughs> the government of Assad. Because uh, the, the Syrians, they are the only players who can really counter Iranian influence in this country, not, uh, not Russia. But, but the Iranian government. Rem uh, you, you probably remember what, what the situation was in the 90s, when Hafez was uh, still ruling the country and when, when the Syrian government was strong. The, the, the influence of Iran was very limited, from my point of view. You correct me if I'm wrong. But, you know, what I saw that the Iranian influence began to grow only after 2005, when the Syrians felt, felt pressure on them and they, when they had no choice uh, of, uh, but to go to the Iranians and to ask the Iranians for help and to become part of this resistance access. They simply had no choice. So Damascus should be given a choice. What Russia is trying to do when we talk about this uh, gas pipeline to Lebanon, uh, actually this, uh, this project should solve two problems. One, to stabilize the situation in Lebanon, which is very disturbing for us now. And it, it, Lebanon is absolutely essential for, uh, for Russian plans in Syria, from many points of view. And of course, the second goal is to bring, uh, the, Syria, uh, to bring the, the Syrian government back to the Arab League. You know, to show that uh, Syria can be, can play a positive role in this region, that Syria is important for the region, that Syria can be part of a solution. So, 
And now what Russia is to really now trying to do is to ensure the recognition of Syria, because it is very important for the economic survival. We can see that uh, the economic crisis in Syria is, is very is severe and it is dangerous. You know, we, we won't be able to do something about stabilizing this country without economic reconstruction. But econ economic reconstruction depends very much at this moment on re-engaging Syria with the region, because uh, the Syrian economy is, no, is very much dependent on exporting goods to the, the, new, to the Arab uh, states of Gaza, first of all. And uh, they need to re-establish trade ties to get out of this isolation. That will give a boost, not, not, that will give a boost to the Syrian economy. So any step that actually make uh, this return of Syria to the Arab community, which, which, uh, which make any step that makes this process easier is welcome and Russia will support it. We, um, um, we can think, we, um, and we would love to do this with you, to think what are the different components that are needed and then you can submit to your government and we can submit to ours a concept that is um, that is not one step after the other, but gives an understanding how the entire strategy, what the entire logic of the entire strategy is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and here I believe um, Cyprus and Greece play an important role. For us, Erdogan, I tell you my personal story also. I was um, in, um, I think, 2016, I was asked by the National Security Council um, to go with a French general to to Turkey, and I met um, uh, Vice President um, Gotul Muz, who's a very nice guy, um, to see if we could come to terms with the Turks. And they, there were official negotiations going on, and we were actually checking on them behind their doors without them knowing. And after a year of talks, which were not too, um, I, I, my, my, um, recommendation was um, don't renew the relations, don't renew the relations. Um, there is so much inherent poison in every word Erdogan says against us. There is so much aggression. There is so much the need to undermine our most basic interests. They did things that are un unheard of, um, which I can't tell you exactly. Um, that. Um, that, that go against all the rules of, 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 of any dialogue. Um, so it, it's, it's not an easy, it, the question is how do we build trust? And maybe Russia can help in rebuilding. If we rebuild trust with, between the two, between us, which is relatively easy. Um, um, also not full, not, not totally easy, but, but possible. And then we could be help to build trust with the others. Um, it's a challenge. It's also a question, not only a statement. Mm. Well, if you are talking about the Turkish role, yes, we'll, uh, we're still in the process of adjusting. And, uh, but, you know, I, have, I can see very um, several parallels. Uh, between Russian policy towards Eastern Mediterranean and the Turkish policy. And that is why I call uh, Russia and Turkey frenemies or, well, we are, uh, the two countries are rivals at, at the moment. But still, what, what I admire is that actually there is still ability to find compromises, at least tactical compromises. We cannot overcome this rivalry because both countries have uh, strategic interests. And I st still believe that the Turks have more uh, strategic interests than Russia in this region, uh, uh, simply because of the geography, even if we don't take into consideration other factors. But um, I think what, what Russia really enjoys is very uh, good mutual understanding with the Turks. What, uh, and even, you know, for example, in March uh, to 2020, when there was fighting in Idlib, you know, I was talking to my friends from the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they were saying, don't worry, we'll, 
we'll handle this situation. And uh, they, they were always saying, we, we have a very, uh, uh, you know, stable dialogue with the Turks and we'll manage to find some solution for this particular crisis. So uh, I think uh, that gives us hope that Turkey, uh, that Turkey can still be, become also a positive player as soon as the uh, the balance of interest of interest is found the, but that requires a very uh, complicated negotiating process i i can understand this but uh, we should start uh, from we should we should do something about it and uh, the negotiate well to have some results we should negotiate uh, after sure. all sure sure yeah. Um, you know, my first, the first lesson I got when I started to be active was from Mayor Fredge from Bethlehem. I don't know if you remember him or you know of him. He's a wonderful man. And he told me, yeah, yeah, before you talk, first listen. And, you know, to listen to them, to see where they see. Um, and the listening is also to listen proactively. Um, where they see ways to overcome. Yes, sure. Sure, the, we have, I, you know, um, the, um, there is this Turkish-Egyptian confrontation, which is very bad, and we are very, very clear uh, on what side we are. And, uh, and part of the talks that um, why um, Vice President Kutilmuz was um, interested in talking to, me, to us was to get okay to take measures against the Egyptian government. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you know, we are not total idiots. Um, and, um, and it frightened me. It frightened. They said, you know, um, it is an illegitimate government and all, all this nonsense. And, um, uh, and our relations to Egypt are of enormous importance. Uh, and we will do everything to maintain and strengthen them. Uh, also in the Eastern Mediterranean and also in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are common interests with Russia. Maybe this is another issue that reflects on... on because your relations with Cairo are good. They're mm -hmm. not bad. And, um, not as good as yours. <laughs> okay, okay. And, you know, um, uh, we did help. We we had a major impact on the, the American, I believe, the American policy towards Egypt was under Obama outrageously stupid. Oh, yes. Um, but um, but we we changed. We um, we had Boogie Yalon, who was Minister of Defense, went to see the Americans, and the Americans listened at times. And um, oh. say, so, you know... Um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is a disaster, and they were not really legitimately elected. This was um, very unclear what the outcome of the elections was. And say they won the elections, or well, you could say at the same time the other side won the elections. It was very arbitrary. And, um, uh, but Egyptian relations are very, very important to us. And I think they are important to, to, greet the, to Greece and to Cyprus too. This you is also to come into the... the no, uh, I, I, we agree exactly on what you're saying, so it's... Uh, mm. I, I don't want to take up the time. So, um, Egypt, you know, um, there's this um, Red Sea, um, um, now the, there's the EMG, the um, EM, um, Eastern Mediterranean, EMGF, Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, which, um, which takes care of stability in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, there is now the forum, the um, Red Sea Council, mm -hmm. where um, in order to be act active, um, to, to be effective, it needs, um, uh, it needs also Israeli Israeli support. Matrocer, Matrocer, 
אתם... אה, יופי. תודה. You know, the um, stability in the Red Sea is a major interest of everybody. You have tremendous, tremendous um, de- development potentials that come from Saudi Arabia. Um, we don't have to profit from us, but the entire, the entire Middle East, the Egyptians can profit, the Palestinians. <laughs> no, in, 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 uh, in, I, I mean, since uh, we've taken up very much of your time would you like to sort of uh, give the most important uh, uh, elements of of, of, of what uh, you know we were talking about and I, I think you you, you did uh, begin uh, just a minute ago I think with what uh, what what Russia stands for in the end of the day you know it, it is you Uh, and it's standing in the world and it's standing in the uh, 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 please go ahead <laughs> well as I said there are the, well I can only say the obvious things that uh, there are several levels of Russia's foreign policy on the strategic level Russia is still trying to reestablish itself as an important and a positive player. And to re-engage with the West this is for sure you know uh, still we don't see that many uh, alternatives to re-engaging with the West but what is uh, always alienate in Russia that uh, we can uh, now see only hostile uh, attitude on behalf of the Europeans on behalf of the Americans and it is a problem uh, but you And, and uh, as we since we talk about the tactical issues well of course Russia is trying to be uh, well uh, to find uh, ways to return to the regions which were always important for its security for its economic development and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean is one of these regions well so The, that's the point but uh, I don't think that Russia w- will ever try to play a destabilizing role but Russia will and uh, I'm sure of that the, the, this is kind of a mantra in Moscow that Russia must uh, uh, protect its uh, vital interests in the Mediterranean as well and uh, what is more important those interests are very uh, specific. because now it is mostly about security and when it comes to security Russia can be very tough so it's better to engage in a dialogue and to set um, some well probably some red lines to uh, to work out some rules of engagement that will all uh, help uh, prevent uh, any kind of confrontation and on the contrary it might also be create some positive atmosphere for cooperation because Russia can play a positive role in this region well thank you the, the, this is yeah, yeah here you uh, anything uh, else no no I, I believe I believe that there has been this this discussion is has been of great importance um, you know um, the the um, um, most important in all these issues is the understanding um, um, understanding the the sensitivities I personally mm-hmm. believe that um, that um, the Americans um, um, mishand you know the, if you look at the the latest history of the late 90s and and 2001 2002 um, Russia was looking at No, is, is reaching out to the West and offering mm-hmm. all its support. Absolutely. The, what? Yes, you are um, absolutely right. And, yes. and, the, and the Europeans and the Americans moved into areas which, which you know, um, um, anybody who understands a little bit of Russian history, I uh, think that there was, um, um, and then, and, and, and on the, you know, um, We, we feel much you know um, I grew up uh, uh, after the Holocaust um, 
we we were Russia's, you know, our suffering and Russia's suffering uh, have a great, great, some important bondage. Mm -hmm. And we have to see how we use it and how we prevent uh, disasters that can happen because of of very strong, um, um, also differences that their, conf their conflicting interests, their diverging interests, and their converging interests. And we have to see how we work on the converging interests as much as possible to minimize the conflict. And, um, well, Dr. Shukov, thank you very much. Thank I you. hope it was uh, uh, productive for you also. For us, it was extremely uh, interesting and productive. And, Hopefully, we can continue the dialogue at some point, uh, if you would be so willing. Yeah, sure. I will, okay. I will be always glad to talk to you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.